Hawaii is a weird state. Firstly, it's 2,900 miles from the rest of the United States. For a comparison, the distance from London to Iran is closer. And also, although the American South's summers beg to differ, Hawaii is the only American state entirely in the tropics. And while most of the United States is mostly European culturally, with large amounts of culture from everywhere, especially Africa, Hawaii is a pan-Pacific oasis, with cultures mixing from all over that planet-sized ocean. And because of this, Hawaii is the only plurality Asian state in America. Hawaii is basically a caravan and oasis city in the desert that is the ocean, where travelers and traders from all over come and stay. And so this video asks the question, what if the United States never did annex these small Pacific islands? How would the Hawaiian archipelago be different in this separate world? And how would these islands smaller than New Jersey or Israel affect the rest of the world throughout history? The answer is a hell of a lot in many ways they're going to surprise you. You know, I considered wearing a Hawaiian shirt for this video, since wearing a suit really did not seem very appropriate for Hawaii. However, I am an uptight Howley, meaning I do not own a Hawaiian shirt, and since I am a cheap uptight Howley, I felt no need to buy one. And since I am a non-Hawaiian, I apologize for mispronouncing some of these native Hawaiian names. I will try my best, however, I do not promise that I will succeed. So let's start with some history to round out the other history you'll be getting later in this video. So the Hawaiian archipelago were first settled around 300 years after the birth of Christ, when Polynesian explorers from likely Tahiti discovered the islands, and until around 1800 AD, it was a group of warring principalities fighting with each other, and then King Kamehameha united the archipelago using Western technology. By the way, the islands were discovered by James Cook, a British explorer and general badass, and there was a fair amount of Western contact, mainly from whalers from New England, who were very productively hunting their quarry into extinction. And they used the islands as a general party base while they sailed really unforgiving seas like the Bering Strait and other such godforsaken locations. The Hawaiian monarchy was a bona fide organization and something worthy of respect. It had ambassadors with the United States, France, and Britain, the only non-European indigenous monarchy to be recognized by those nations. And the king in the late 19th century actually went on a tour of Asia and wanted to model his future off Japan and what they were doing at that time. And it had a complex organizational and an administrative system with a complex system of theocracy, taboos, and caste. The islands had been succumbing to Western influence for quite a while, and, for example, in 1819, King Kamehameha II got rid of the complex system of taboos that had dominated local Polynesian life called the kapu, and it included such things as men and women were not allowed to eat together, women were not allowed to eat such things as pork, coconuts, or most variety of banana, and it was not allowed to make physical contact with the king's fingernails. And you would think that this would have been driven by Western missionaries, but no, this was done entirely independently. And the Western missionaries only showed up in 1820, well, this was done in 1819. And, but this left the Western missionaries in a remarkably good position, since Hawaii had no religion. And so most of Hawaii ended up with Protestant Christianity of the New England variety. The monarchy abolished the pre-existing system of feudal land ownership and replaced it with private property. However, the literacy and wealth requirements to buy property meant that most native Hawaiians could not do it. And so truly vast parts of the land became owned by rich western sugar growers. And just like in the New World, around 90% of the native Hawaiian population died off due to western diseases. But instead of African slaves who were brought in the New World to work in the sugar field, it was mostly Asians from areas like the Philippines, Japan, China, and Korea. The Kamehamehan dynasty died out due to incest, and so the upper classes elected David Kalakaua to become the new king. However, he was fabulously corrupt. 
And so the Western landowners rebelled and put a constitution in place to curtail the power of the monarchy and placed his sister Lilio Kalani in power. When she tried to claw back some of the monarchy's previous power, the white landowners rebelled again and evicted the monarchy. The U.S. minister for Hawaii, John L. Steves, also helped with this and sent some marines to help with the rebellion of the white landowners. And finally, the white landowner uh, republic, led by uh, Sanford Dole, asked the United States to be annexed. So U.S. President Grover Cleveland actually didn't approve of the idea of colonization. And so he asked Sanford Dole to put Lilio Kalani back on the throne. However, he also asked Lilio Kalani to give amnesty to the rebels, and neither Sanford nor Lilio Kalani agreed to these propositions. And so Grover bumped it over to the U.S. Senate's Foreign Policy Committee, and this was run at that moment by uh, pro-annexation Democrats. And remember, this was the era in which the Democrats stood for the exact opposite things as today. And so the Democrats approved of annexation, and this was before the U.S. Congress cowardly gave foreign policy effectively to the president. And so the U.S. annexed Hawaii. And so the easiest way to start this alternate history is to simply have Kalakaua be much less corrupt. Remember, he was voted in by the upper classes that were disproportionately white. So he theoretically could have pleased everyone. And so if he just sat still and looked pretty and didn't share any foolish land reforms, then he could have maintained power and not created the struggle for power that resulted in the power vacuum that resulted in the U.S. takeover. Some of you are going to argue that the U.S. colonization of Hawaii was inevitable since the U.S. was so imperialistic in this era. I disagree. The United States was actually relatively restrained when it came to colonialism in this era when it was super rampant. Remember, this was a time in which Belgium, possibly the least militaristic and expansionist people in Europe, were colonizing and subduing an area larger than the whole of Western Europe or the American South. In this era, being a modern nation and not having colonies was humiliating, and it's useful to view colonialism at the end of the 19th century more as a fashion trend like bell-bottom jeans or man buns, but on a national level. In this era, the United States took pride in being an ex-colony that didn't purposely go about trying to colonize other nations. And this was obnoxiously hypocritical at times, because the U.S. was easily the nation that took the most native land and put it under the plow. However, outside of its current national borders, the United States actively decided not to colonize the Yucatan, Panama, Cuba, and Nicaragua. And the U.S., if it really was a player in the colonialism game, would have likely looked something more like this. And the U.S. 1898 colonization of the Philippines was a hugely controversial decision at the time, even for the president who did it, William McKinley, who spent whole nights reading scripture and praying, trying to figure out the moral stance, and ending up with a white man's burden stance that the U.S. should colonize the Philippines, which is kind of funny because that's the exact opposite of what the moral stance would be considered today. Without Hawaii, the U.S. would have never annexed the Philippines either. Using the coal engines that ships use at this point, it would just simply be impossible to attack the Philippines without a base somewhere in the middle of the Pacific to resupply. And I mean, launching a transoceanic invasion without a forward base is really difficult anyway. And so this would make the U.S. colonization of the Philippines untenable. And this kind of makes sense since what the hell was the U.S. even doing in the Philippines in the first place? It's not like it's part of the U.S. strategic self-interest or anything. And so in this timeline, during the Spanish-American War, the United States would still conquer Cuba, while the Philippines would hobble along as a Spanish colony for a few years more. The Japanese, late to the imperialism party, were looking for colonies in their general area, and in our world they fought with the Chinese and the Russians to take their client states in regions like Korea, Manchuria, Taiwan, and Okinawa. Meanwhile, with the Philippines being so close to the Japanese home islands, and brimming with so many resources, and run by a weak Spanish regime far away, it would simply be far too tempting a prize for the Japanese government. And the Japanese would win this war because, remember in this era, they beat the fucking Russians. And do you think the Spanish really stand a chance when the Japanese beat the Russian military a few years later? Considering Japanese racial attitudes towards the Filipinos could probably be described as the antithesis of woke, we can expect Japanese settlers to be brought in as the native Filipino population would be treated terribly and exploited, and as the resources of the Philippines would be brought back to Japan. 
Meanwhile, halfway back across the Pacific, you could have considered Hawaii a de facto British colony for this whole time without the British even knowing about it. That's because the Hawaiians considered themselves part of the British Commonwealth and a British protectorate, which is why the Union Jack is part of the Hawaiian flag. However, the British never actually recognized this, and it's kind of like the seventh wheel friend you had in high school who considered themselves part of your friend group, but no one else in the friend group considered them part of your friend group. The reason the British never incorporated Hawaii was that there was no one to make them feel the need. For example, in Asia, probably a solid majority of British foreign policy was based around trying to prevent the Russians from getting too big, and you could say a similar thing in Africa with the French. Meanwhile, Hawaii is literally the most remote large archipelago on Earth, and since trans-Pacific trade wasn't very important for the European powers, neither was Hawaii. The Japanese, however, would start to leer at Hawaii. Hawaii had an enormous Japanese ethnic population that moved in to work in the sugar fields, and they were treated abysmally. And the Japanese government back in Tokyo would view it as their duty to protect these ethnic Japanese. And so this would freak the British out, who would worry that if the Japanese seized Hawaii, it would give them a far too strategic position in the middle of the Pacific. It would make voyages for the British from Australia to Canada far more difficult, and so the British would formally annex Hawaii as part of their dominion at this point. Not much would actually change in the local politics, as most of the British Empire was administered by local elites of one stripe or another, with only a minority being run directly from London. And so in this timeline, the Kalakauan dynasty would continue to rule over the Hawaiian Islands, with the biggest changes being the addition of a British naval base and a governor general's palace. And the islands were already de facto run by white landowners, and they wouldn't clash much with the British Empire, which was the ultimate club for white landowners. Hawaii is mostly irrelevant to the rest of the world, and so large stretches of the early 20th century would have been exactly the same. World War I would still break out, and the Kaiser and the Sultan would still fight a good fight before being defeated, communism would still rise in Russia, and the stock market would still crash due to a misallocation of funds. And this would keep going until the Pacific Theater and World War II would suddenly give Hawaii newfound importance. In this world, with the United States' furthest western, or eastern depending on your perspective, possession being Alaska, it would mean the United States would simply not be a Pacific player. After the fall of France, the Japanese look at their geopolitical situation, greatly improved by control of the Philippines, and simply see weak European colony after weak European colony to the south. The Japanese would invade French Indochina, the Americans would place trade embargoes on Japan. To get rubber, the Japanese would then declare war on the Dutch East Indies and the British Empire. The British, mainly in a war for survival against Hitler, and with the Japanese thousands of miles away, would not adequately defend Hawaii meaning in the months after what was Pearl Harbor in our timeline, the Japanese would seize Hawaii. It's hard to overemphasize the importance of Pearl Harbor in getting the United States into World War II. Before it, more than 70% of Americans were for neutrality, and after it, the general zeitgeist was they wanted to get Japan on a spit and roast it until only ashes were left. But in this timeline, with the British in control of Hawaii, that simply would not happen. The United States would not get in the war. FDR would still try to get the U.S. involved, but without any U.S. possessions outside of the U.S. mainland, it would simply be impossible to get the mostly isolationist American public to stand by him. So I've already made a What If the Nazis Won World War II timeline, and it starts with Hitler never declaring war on America, and the Nazis winning at the Battle of Moscow. And I really should get around to making what if the Japanese won World War II timeline. And honestly, I'm just going to outsource mostly to those two videos. And I'm going to be quite cursory here, because if I go into any depth about either of those topics, it'll easily quadruple the length of this video. Without American help, Britain realizes that it can't win the Battle of the Atlantic, and so they sign a peace treaty with the Nazis after a few years, recognizing their control over France and giving them Germany's pre-World War I colonies back. Meanwhile, the Russians did most of the job of winning World War II, however, they couldn't have won the Eastern Front by themselves without the massive aid given them by the United States, the massive bombing campaigns on German industry, and the opening up of fronts in Western Europe. 
And so in this timeline, Germany and Russia fight each other to a bloody standstill, with a border likely being drawn in western Ukraine, after both sides had bled themselves practically dry. In the east, the Japanese conquer a large empire stretching the whole Asian Pacific region. The massive Indian army keeps them from conquering India, and after the war, nearly mutinies and forces the British to concede independence to India. The Japanese conquer most of the populous regions of China, while the nationalist government survives and based out of Sichuan. It's possible the Japanese use the never-ending war between the Germans and Russians to pick off the far eastern Siberian provinces from Russia as well. Meanwhile, Hawaii would be crushed under the new Japanese Imperium. The previously degraded ethnic Japanese population would become the new aristocracy, and boatloads of Japanese settlers would be brought in to make the island's majority Yamato, and the local Filipinos, Polynesians, and Chinese would be horribly oppressed. The islands with the same general appeal climactically as today would become a hot spot for Japanese tourism. The world ends up looking something like this. The world is a multipolar struggle between the Russians, who become a paranoid North Korea-style state, Germany, Japan, and the Anglo-Americans. Ha! I changed control over a minor group of islands and I got the world to look like this. Do I get a cookie or something? What if Altist? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please comment, subscribe, stay tuned for more content, tell a friend, and thank you so much for watching and have a good day. Since I have nothing better to do, I will awkwardly watch you until you subscribe. You know you could speed this up a bit. I don't actually have all day. I have a meeting I need to get to.